thanks everyone for coming out, and uh, thanks Carrie for a nice introduction. And uh, I should you also have it? what? You nabbed it. The book is right here. Oh, yeah. Good. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Carrie was amazing when I was uh, make, making this book uh, project come together, and this exhibit too is really worth going over to. It's really amazing what Carrie has, has found in our special collections. And in my talk here, I'll, I'll be showing you some of the images that came from our own uh, Claremont College special collections as well as some of the other uh, images from the book that I just finished, which has a lot of interesting uh, figures by students. Uh, some students helped with designing uh, interactive uh, software for exploring constellations and for drawing star figures. So it's kind of a fun project that way, too. Uh, anyway, uh, most of you have <coughs> seen this image, which is a uh, schematic of the human quest to look beyond, to look beyond our small little sphere that we live in. And uh, what most people around the world have attempted this project in different ways. And, and as you look around the world, you can see in their constellations and their uh, various models of the universe and in their practices of astronomy, a mirror of the values that people across the Earth hold that are diverse from each culture come different priorities, environments, and needs, but also universal that people around the world all seem to be engaged in this quest from some deep internal need to understand and, and some deep connection with the sky. And that's why I, I actually came up with the title of The Power of Stars, because it's that power of the stars to move us that I think is one of the most universal human emotions. Uh, it's one that you see in any night that you're out under a clear, uh, moonless, dark sky. So uh, different cultures have responded to that power differently. Uh, our culture, of course, came up with a zoo of animals and Greek mythological figures. This is the North Celestial Pole from one of our special collection atlases on display at the exhibit. If we zoom up on the uh, little bit here, which is the back end of the Great Bear, uh, otherwise more popularly known as the Big Dipper, we can use it as an example of how cultures around the world looked at those same stars and found different patterns. So these are the stars. They have Arabic names because in the 8th and 9th century, the Arabs were the leading astronomers of the world. Uh, you can also look at the Chinese constellation names. The Chinese were busy from about 200 BC <coughs> up to about 1400 AD, cataloging all the stars and measuring uh, their positions, uh, making atlases of their own, and uh, cataloging anything that changed in the sky. So they gave these same stars names that uh, refer to the different uh, instruments they use, the jade sighting tube, celestial balance, armillary sphere, and some of the phenomena that they thought the stars uh, indicated in the sky. But uh, other people, uh, the Chinese also simultaneously thought of these stars as being symbolic of their government. <clears throat> as the, uh, so the part near the celestial pole was thought to be most associated with the emperor, because it never moved. It sort of remained fixed on the sky, and everything wheeled around it. Uh, other cultures used this uh, same part of the sky uh, in different ways. This is an uh, image from the Hawaiian star map. And you can see the pole star here, and then surrounded by a network of stars they would use for navigation. And the Hawaiians from a very early age, the Tahitians, Polynesians, memorized lists of 20 to 40 stars that they could use if they're out in the open ocean for finding their latitude, for finding the next island. And they could use that to cross uh, several thousands of miles in their little open boats. Uh, the Inuit saw up here, and it's very hard to see with that lighting, <clears throat> but there's a little caribou up here in the north uh, there at the um, Big Dipper. The Chumash, a tribe near uh, us in, in sort of Malibu area, uh, saw uh, a region where Sky Coyote and the boys who turned into geese were located near the Big Dipper, uh, as well as Scorpion Woman, uh, the most powerful figure of the night sky for the ancient Chumash who encountered the souls of the dead as they wandered across the sky on the path of the Milky Way. <clears throat> uh, other cultures, such as the uh, Navajo, <clears throat> saw in the Big Dipper uh, one of the two of the first man, first woman that were so important for their cosmology. So uh, male revolving one is their name for the Big Dipper, and female revolving one is the name for uh, Cassiopeia. And it's kind of interesting, too, that for uh, many cultures, Cassiopeia is associated with female figures of great power, uh, either Cassiopeia herself, a queen from Ethiopia, or a female revolving one, the first woman, or a scorpion woman next door over here. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, you can also see over here the Weaving Princess was a central figure of Chinese Star Wars, and that's in the same general region with the uh, Summer Triangle. Anyway, so these are some of the constellations that we came together uh, came together for the book project, and we thought it was fun to include some cultures that people don't usually think about when they think of star lore. Usually you're more familiar with these kind of maps. And if we go to the southern hemisphere, we can also see interesting groupings from people who existed be well before the Europeans so-called discovered them. Uh, so these are the, uh, the maps that we see for European figures. They include things like sextants, which are in the south celestial pole, the parts of ships, sterns of ships. You can see uh, other uh, creatures that the Europeans first discovered in the southern hemisphere. Uh, in the part that maybe most of you are most familiar with is the uh, Southern Cross in Alpha and Beta Centauri. <clears throat> we can see a lot of other constellation groupings from other cultures that predated the Europeans. So if we zoom in here on the uh, Southern Cross, this is a picture I took when I was down in Chile. You can see the Southern Cross, Alpha and Beta Centauri. And in this region are some amazing dark clouds. The Milky Way itself has lots of interstellar dust and gas that's forming new stars. And these clouds actually have shapes. And some cultures, rather than making figures out of the stars, would recognize in the shapes of the dark clouds different animals, different creatures. And uh, for the uh, one example of that is if we look at Alpha Beta Centauri Southern Cross, kind of rotate them a little bit here, we can overlay the Incan constellations that they saw. <clears throat> and in the dark clouds near Alpha and Beta Centauri is a shape that looks something like a llama. So for the Inca, they saw a large llama and a little llama. Uh, much as the Europeans would see a great bear and a little bear in the north sky, they saw this pair of llamas. One nice thing, too, is you have dark cloud shapes here and then light stars forming something like eyes on this llama. And it's uh, kind of a neat little contrast to the Europeans. They also saw a little creature called a tinamu next to it and a little toad here. They saw a fox. All these animals in the sky for the Inca were uh, mirrors of the life on Earth. And the, uh, Milky Way itself was a river that provided life to those animals. So they could see in the shapes the uh, health of their environment, and they would often use the stars as a way of forecasting weather, of predicting crop yields, that sort of thing. Uh, the other uh, <laughs> constellations from the Inca are, are hard to see here, but there's a whole range of them across. Uh, we have our great llama constellation, toad, tinamu, uh, and so forth um, for the Inca. Um, there's also a group that I found uh, for Australian constellations. Aboriginal Australians have really interesting sky lore. And they have some animals that you'd expect in the sky, like a giant uh, crocodile, and there's a big uh, kangaroo up here somewhere. Um, they also have some things that you might not have heard of, like a bunyip. <laughs> and the bunyip is actually for uh, Australian kids, uh, one of the uh, most feared creatures that would come out at night and grab you. So. They put the bunyip over here in this part of the sky, a very fearsome part uh, toward the north of the sky. Anyway, so those are some of the different constellations through the ages. Um, next thing I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the instruments and uh, tools that stargazers have used through the centuries. And this is kind of uh, in connection with the exhibit, because we have some of our old sextants and devices from Bracket Observatory on display. Uh, so these are some of the displays that I found uh, when I was traveling around through Europe. And uh, most of them come from Cambridge or the British Museum. Uh, you can see an evolution of sundials from these sort of very primitive um, lumps of stone <coughs> into a more elaborate lump of stone. <laughs> This has uh, got all these different little gnomons here. This is in the garden there at Cambridge. A very puzzling device, but somehow uh, someone felt the need to have all of these different clock dials and they could see it from any direction, I guess. Um, <clears throat> sundials evolved into more sophisticated shapes with all kinds of fancy decorations and extra features. There was kind of a competition in Europe to produce the most elaborate and beautiful sundials. So you can see all across Europe people racing to build more magnificent sundials. Some of them are portable. They have little devices in for measuring your position on Earth, compasses. They had little patterns for measuring the season, as if you didn't know the date. You could look right here in the length of the shadow and figure out what the day was. So kind of like a watch that has your date next to it. Yeah. Um, other devices you could use for other things. This is a device that you could use to cite the altitude of the sun. So you didn't want to look at the shadow. 
<coughs> to find out what time it was, you could actually measure the height of the sun. And that has the advantage, too, of helping you figure out your latitude. So uh, they didn't have GPS back then, but they had a lot of little gadgets uh, all the same. Um, this is uh, universal, I guess, not of cultures, but of time. People always inventing new gadgets. Uh, these are things called orary quadrants, and they're also used for sighting solar heights. And there's a little device here that would swing to level as you sighted the sun along here or cast a shadow along here. And these could be used for uh, just telling the time or also telling your latitude. <clears throat> well, the next step up in sophistication from the sundial and orary quadrant is the astrolabe. And these things were first perfected in the um, Arabic world, there is Egyptian, Persian, and uh, other Arabic astrolabes. Uh, the Europeans adopted them sometime around 1300 and added features to them. So these are some of the uh, Persian ones. Uh, I'm told that the Persian and uh, Islamic effort to build better astrolabes was both for navigation and also for an attempt to better know the direction to Mecca and all, all across the Arab world. It was, as you're traveling large distances over land, you want to be able to sight stars in order to figure out where you are and also which direction to, to pray into. And uh, these things are little devices that you can use to uh, figure out from the pattern of stars above you um, what time it is and what latitude you're at. And so they would dial in from this uh, wheel here the observed position of stars. And uh, sometimes they had a little bar on here for sighting a star's altitude. And, so they could be used almost like a telescope, but they weren't quite, uh, they didn't, weren't equipped with optics. <coughs> so a typical astrolabe has these little fingers here that point to the positions of the stars, and then they allow you to look up elevation angles of the stars on given uh, days and times. <coughs> and then you can, uh, as I mentioned, you can see in this one actually names of the stars. There's like Aquila here, uh, you can see Andromeda over here. So each one it corresponds to a different part of the sky. And like I said, some of them were equipped with little sighting devices. They didn't have telescopes yet, but these little devices could be used as sort of little sort of gun sights for aiming at stars and measuring where they are. So this is a useful tool for finding out where you are on Earth. And, and like I said, gadgets are another human universal. So over the years, they became more sophisticated. These things uh, were invented as uh, sort of the next best thing. So you all have iPads, probably. This is their version of the iPad. Uh, the compendium. <laughs> Everyone was getting one back in 1541. <laughs> it does everything. It does, well, maybe not video conferencing, but you have a little device here for pointing at stars and doing calculations. You have a little thing in here for figuring out uh, which zodiacal constellation is going to be visible. You have a little device here for calculating astrological charts. An amazing little gadget. Uh, and uh, more of these things can be seen uh, that combine more functions. Astrolabe, an orrery built together. This models the motions of the sun throughout the zodiac, as well as allows you to sight the stars. Uh, there are other ones that have clock faces on them, but inside there's a little astrolabe. Uh, other ones that uh, have interesting uh, sort of hybrids between telescopes and uh, protractors. And these things are the first sort of instruments that were used to measure accurately the positions of stars. These are astronomical quadrants. And Tycho Brahe famously measured positions of planets using a large quadrant that he built in his special observatory. This is one that came a bit later with an optical path to it. Uh, other devices that are useful for navigators and stargazers, the sextant, and we have a couple of those on display at our exhibit, and a little thing here called a clinometer, and we have one of those also from our bracket observatory. Um, anyway, so through the ages, people built more sophisticated devices, all in the effort to observe the stars, measure their motions, and connect with the power of the celestial sphere. And uh, this is about all the instruments I have. And now I think what I'll do is switch into a third area, again sort of connected to the exhibit, and that is some of the different books. Now remember, there was a day back before the internet for some of you, this may come as a rude shock, but it's <laughs> true. <laughs> now, just this morning in my office, I had a student come in, and he was working on the project. And I gave him some data from a paper from 1992. And he, was, he went away and came back and said, wow, that's amazing. 
they had it pretty accurate for back in 1992. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that, that was sort of the time before 1992, no internet. Now, if you go back even farther, not to 1992, eight, you go 1892, 17, 16, imagine four or 500 years ago. How do you learn? How do you get information? How do you transmit knowledge? Well, books. And books, <laughs> yes, believe it or not. And books here in our Claremont colleges are part of that story. So I thought I'd share with you some of the ways in which books help redefine people's understanding of the universe. And uh, this is something that uh, is kind of a neat thing about Claremont colleges. And people have generously donated many of these books to help us understand, uh, help our students understand with primary materials what's going on. So these are some of our books. And they sort of chronicle at least the Western evolution of understanding of the universe. We also have some Mayan and Aztec figures in our exhibit. But you can see kind of from figures from our Claremont colleges an evolution from a violent Mytholo mythological beginning, uh, <clears throat> one in which the Earth existed below spheres of fire. Uh, the sublunary sphere here was thought to be an area where there was change and disease and strife. And then above this sort of unchanging ethereal realm, and then beyond all that, heaven. And many of the figures in the books help people orient themselves in this universe. So you have within the book these little things that can rotate. These are called volvels, I believe, yes. And uh, they can actually be used as a little calculator. So this is you standing on the Earth, and you can move yourself around. Now, some person four or 500 years ago took the trouble to hand attach these little things, cut them out, illustrate them, and they're really neat. You can use them to recreate the celestial sphere for different latitudes and actually see how high the stars are. So it's actually, in a way, recreating the conditions that the astrolabe would then measure and it describes all of the different ways in which the celestial sphere changes at these different latitudes. Again, this is about 500 years ago this book is doing this. <clears throat> there are actually multiple versions, some from Spain, uh, that show uh, really beautifully illustrated versions of these little guys standing on these little round earths and uh, navigating their way through the celestial sphere. Some of them also have devices that I have to admit I have no idea what they're used for, and this is one of those. <laughs> And the little guy here is sort of mocking me, I think, this, <coughs> try as I, I, I could. I, I really couldn't figure out what this was for. Um, anyway, so this um, other devices, other figures in the, in the book help document our understanding of how the Earth, Sun, and Moon are interrelated. So here you see a figure from a 16th century book showing the Sun shining down and creating a shadow of the Moon. And uh, this is actually showing this little guy here uh, in a state of solar eclipse, whereas these two guys are not in solar eclipse, explaining some of the, the, the basics of it. And it, it actually describes, so for if the moon is far than, than the earth, uh, the shadow of the earth, and therefore the eclipse of the sun cannot be universal. So it's explaining how different parts of the earth will see the eclipse. <coughs> and then it says, yet all the histories do affirm that the eclipse of the sun was, uh, was universal at the death of Christ. So there is an interesting in these old books connection between the theology and the astronomy that, that you can see in the exhibit. Some of them have really sort of creative little diagrams of people running around on round earths. And I think this was actually to get people used to the idea that the earth was round. They would draw it in a cartoonish sort of way. That's just my own theory. Um, but it's all, again, trying to recreate the perspective of what it's like to be embedded on a little ball suspended in space. And that's an essential part of reconstructing our civilization's view of the universe, which at the time was shifting away from this geocentric view toward the heliocentric, toward the non-Earth-centered view. And we can see, uh, this is a nice little diagram showing the sun <coughs> creating lunar phases. Something the Greeks had figured out you know, over 2,000 years ago, but the Europeans were now just rediscovering it. And in a lot of the books from our Claremont colleges, you can see these medieval T-shaped diagrams of the Earth <coughs> with these nested spheres of water, air, fire, which were part of the earlier uh, pre-Socratic cosmology that believed the universe was made of those four elements, earth, air, water, and fire, with ether out in the edges of that. It's also fun to look at these, and you can see connections with the planets here, all represented with their symbols, and uh, astrological and um, metallurgical or alchemic uh, elements. So you can see earth in the middle here, air, fire, moon. 
And then mercury, it describes uh, what it's made out of. It's made out of quicksilver, otherwise now known as mercury. Uh, you have Venus here, which is cold and moist, benevolent. It's associated with the element copper. You have uh, the sun, hot and dry, made of gold. All of these different uh, metals that we see here on Earth were thought by early alchemists to be uh, drawing in the powers of those different planets. And they thought by, by mixing them together, they could tap into some of that power beyond Earth. And again, uh, more of our Claremont College images here showing the uh, motions of planets as conceived by early astronomers being part of epicycles and uh, the uh, interesting constructions you make with off-center circular motion being needed to create the elliptical motions of planets. Um, so we have many of these images on display at the exhibit, so I urge you to come out. And then we also can show the shift that comes with Galileo, the, the Earth being in the center. And when you put the Earth, oh, sorry, the, the Sun in the center, when you put the Sun in the center, you get this entire uh, shift in the model of the universe, and all of the explanations become much simpler. So uh, one way to illustrate that is to use these images from Solarius, which are from the Huntington Library. And this is just beautifully illustrated and has uh, atlases of different world systems. So we start out with the Earth in the center, and then we go off and chart different zodiacal signs and their interconnections. That's the science of astrology. And in the book, I give a little bit of a history of astrology. Um, and then from there, we can also see planets as they move around the zodiac. They do strange kind of looping motions. And I have a little video here that sort of illustrates how that all works. And so we'll just set this up here. Uh, whoops, the video is part of this exhibit that uh, was installed in the beautiful science uh, exhibit at Huntington Library. If any of you guys have a chance to go there, it's really amazing. It has a wonderful display of the history of astronomy. Anyway, if you look at the Earth in the middle, you can see all the planets moving around us. And in the Ptolemaic system, their motions were circles. But what people on Earth would observe is planets stopping and moving backwards and coming forward again. And so in order to recreate that motion, Ptolemy uh, created a set of these epicycles where planets almost like on a Ferris wheel are doing these little looping motions. And that was able to explain the observed motions very well for about 1,500 years until better data came along. And uh, these uh, charts actually show some of the different motions that come about from the observations in an Earth-centered system. So for example, this is the motion of the moon showing all the different epicycles. These are epicycles of the moon. Uh, you can also see uh, the nested spheres of the Ptolemaic system. And uh, just beautifully illustrated. And books in those days were amazing works of art and uh, were incredibly expensive as well. So they didn't have, um, they didn't fool around. They made just wonderful illustrations. Uh, and then we can see in this, uh, the shift that Tycho made. Tycho Brahe decided to go with a partial, a partially geocentric system in that the Earth is still in the middle, but the Sun has actually taken on the two planets, Mercury and Venus, which orbit around the Sun in these big circles here. And uh, this was one modification to the Ptolemaic system that was a, a step towards being heliocentric. Anyway, lots of difficulties with this system. You have to explain the changing nature of the Sun. There was a theory at the time that clouds would actually look at this, would block the Sun at different times, creating uh, sunspots, and Galileo argued about that with a contemporary. And eventually this uh, solar center, heliocentric centered model prevailed. And these are just illustrations showing, showing different aspects of the heliocentric model that come about. So anyway, these are just beautiful book images that I just felt I had to share with you guys. <clears throat> anyway, so I'm running out of time, so I'm going to flip through these a little bit fast and get us to the last chapter here in this talk. And again, it's just beautiful uh, celestial figures from the Solarius uh, Atlas. And uh, these are all going to be on display at the exhibit in the form of a computer that will flip through all the images. They come from the Huntington Library, but we don't have the original of that one, I don't think, but we're working on it. Okay, so the last bit I wanted to share with you guys is a little bit of the sort of the last couple of centuries. So from uh, you know 1500s all the way past 1992 to uh, the present day. And so in this way, we can look at how models of the universe have evolved. So all of you guys probably know that our species has had a few different ideas about how the universe was structured. 
It could be the goddess Nut is stretched across us as the sky being held up by her brother, the air god Shu. Uh, or maybe it's a celestial slab held up by posts. These were both ideas that the ancient Egyptians had. Uh, many of the celestial objects were thought to be carried across the river that crosses the sky in little boats. Um, the uh, Babylonians also had ideas that included layers of, of water above the earth, the earth itself floating on water, and then layers of sort of gemstones above where the planets and stars would reside. The ancient Norse had interesting genealogy where frost giants and primordial cows produced their gods, and uh, their universe model included a giant tree called the Yggdrasil that connected all the different worlds, our world being Midgard, and then a ring of mountains out beyond, and then a series of underworlds and overworlds. This is a chart I found that actually catalogs all of them. So you have Midgard, where we live, and then up above you have Asgard, where the gods would live, and then down below, things like Niflheim, Muspelheim, and the uh, land of the dead known as Hell. Uh, so these are all different ideas that have prevailed over the centuries. Chinese also had their ideas. They had several different ideas. One, folk cosmology involving Kanku, a giant who created the earth, chiseled out the mountains and rivers with a giant hammer, and then died, and, and his body became part of the earth. Uh, more scientific cosmologies from ancient China include this one, which is uh, called the Shangye uh, cosmology from about 300 AD. It had the preposterous idea for ancient people that the earth was actually just one of many planets floating in a vast space and then the other planets would actually move around in that space. So, largely moved about by chi, the energy of the universe. Crazy idea, and it was promptly rejected uh, by a more suitable model that had the Earth sitting enclosed in a glass dome on a square base and it's surrounded by a sea of water. And this was the prevailing Chinese cosmology during most of the time of the uh, 200 BC to 1400 AD when their astronomical records uh, there was a competing scientific cosmology from earlier that was rejected. This is the uh, so-called uh, hen's egg cosmology, which has the Earth as this little sort of yoke suspended in a round celestial sphere. And the Chinese, while they had interesting ideas about the structure of the universe, were excellent observers, and they would tie together the celestial sphere, which they can model with instruments of their own, uh, with their ideas about philosophy. And they would connect the five elements in, from Earth, just as the alchemists of Europe did, with the various motions and properties of planets. Well, um, most of you have seen some of the basics of the Greek cosmology, which I've already talked about. I'm not going to belabor it too much, but there's some interesting little uh, variations on the models of the universe from ancient Greece. You have your basic geocentric structure, which we talked about. In some cases, the Pythagoreans uh, would associate each of these planets with numbers, and also with each planet's motion with a musical tone. So there was literally a music of the spheres, according to the Pythagoreans, that pervaded the universe. The only reason why we don't hear it is that we've been embedded in it forever. Um, likewise, they imagined the Earth to be in the middle of the universe, but not stationary. They thought it actually orbited around a central fire. But they weren't willing to go as far as to admit that that could possibly be the sun. So that was just centuries too far off. Uh, the power of stars literally came from fire, according to a lot of Greek theories. So they imagined the Earth sitting on a slab surrounded by hoops of fire. And early pre-Socratic philosophers added a little wrinkle to this by putting a cap above the fire, thereby allowing us to see stars as holes in that cap. And this worked for a couple hundred years until the uh, Platonic system came along and described instead of fire, uh, the motion of the stars as being perfect circular motion and being made of ether, the so-called crystalline sphere model. And this one prevailed, as the video was showing, for about 1,500 years with refinements from Ptolemy. <coughs> but of course, the modern scientific cosmology came along. And uh, we now, as modern people, and I always like to use that term carefully, because of course, modern, this 2011 we're living in, someday will be as ancient as 1992. And uh, people look back and go, wow, how did you ever think that? But all the same, we have some things in our favor. We have people like Kepler here. Uh, just abandoning his ideas of nested platonic solids and coming up with his models of planetary motion. And people like Galileo persuasively arguing that the heliocentric picture works and it can actually produce these backward motions. 
And we had people uh, that, with this system, were able to reverse the place of Earth and Sun and create, uh, for the first time, a description of what we think is the correct, we know is the correct universe, that is the Earth, one of many planets orbiting our Sun. And all the uh, beauty of that is that it creates uh, all, all manner of uh, machinery that uh, no, is no longer necessary. All the epicycles, deference, and so on just fall away. Added to that, the mathematics of Newton and the uh, telescopic inventions of that period, uh, we have a huge explosion of knowledge that comes about in the 18th century as Herschel and others begin cataloging stars with their new telescopes. And so the history of stargazing in this period involves larger telescopes, systematic scientific discoveries about the numbers and distributions of stars, and a shift once again in our perspective where we're no longer the center, our sun is no longer the center of the universe, but part of what uh, was described as a vast congery of stars, one of literally millions of stars spread out in a disk. And that adjustment in our perspective also required a century or so to solidify People like uh, Huggins and Fraunhofer were able to take spectra of stars, and uh, George Ellery Hale himself, uh, one who worked a bit with our uh, Claremont College astronomer at that time, um, worked to build bigger telescopes and get better observations. And here we can see the world's largest telescope that George Ellery Hale made in Wisconsin. Here's the next one he built <coughs> just down the road in Mount uh, Wilson. This is 1908, the 60-inch telescope. And then the 200-inch telescope at Palomar. Uh, George Ellery Hale, uh, with his, his uh, able observer, uh, Edwin Hubble, were able to use these telescopes to discover the expansion of the universe. And so our modern cosmology involves this knowledge that the universe is moving in such a way that the farther away something is, the faster it's flying away from us. This so impressed people like Einstein that they came back to Pasadena to have a look through these giant telescopes. And uh, Edwin Hubble uh, became a celebrity at this time, and larger and larger telescopes are still being built. We have our Keck telescope now, and we're planning telescopes that go up to 30 meters, which will provide real amazing discoveries. So I guess the final thought here is, well, where, where does this leave us? It leaves us with a picture where things that we thought were normal are no longer normal. So uh, what may be true in sociology is also true in astronomy. Uh, we used to call these things abnormal galaxies, but now we know that in the early universe, all these galaxies are different shapes. They're all crunching together and mixing their stars. And that what we're really seeing now in our part of the universe is abnormal. It's the result of 13.7 billion years of evolution. But for most of our volume that we can see, galaxies are much more active and, and evolving. We're also seeing that what we thought the universe was made out of is not at all the majority of what the universe is made. There's this vast unseen component to the universe. And I think that also you know, transcends astronomy. I think as you go through your studies, you'll find there's a whole lot more to the universe than what you thought. In our case, we see this so-called vacuum energy and dark matter dominates. So we are here, this tiny little bit of 4% of the universe, and this is dark matter and dark energy. So right now, our species and our civilization is adjusting with that further shift in our perspective, that not only are we physically not located in any particular place, but we, material-wise, are just a small contamination on the larger universe. <laughs> this little bit of what we call baryons is not much at all. And the dark matter then becomes uh, more important every year. So getting ways of developing uh, maps of dark matter is important. And our Claremont College students are hard at work at this. <clears throat> this is one of our alumni, Jason Rhodes, who just uh, produced one of the first ever maps of dark matter. We can now use tools like the Hubble Space Telescope to look billions of years into the past and study these blobs of dark matter. These are the first ever maps of dark matter that Jason and his friends had put together. So this is a really amazing time in our perspective of the universe. We know more about what the universe is made about, but also we know probably less about what the universe is made out of than any other time in history. So it's not ether, it's not copper or other metals. It's dark matter and dark energy. And uh, as we look farther away, we see greater evidence of this dark matter, dark energy being dominant. And with our telescopes, we're looking back into the beginnings of time to try to figure out where it all came from. So we sit here at the beginning of this light cone that stretches out 13.7 billion years in the past. And in that early universe, we can see the evolution 
from clouds of gas that are intermixed with light to a separation of light and matter, and then eventually the formation of these galaxies that we see all around us after about a billion years. And then finally our little Earth and Sun forming around uh, nine billion years after the Big Bang. All of this came from a beginning of particles, a sea of quarks and energy, and uh, it's not even from a single particle that's exploded out in a froth of quantum energy and then collapsed and froze out into the protons, neutrons, and dark matter that we see today. So this is our mythology that we have today. and It's attempting to provide an answer of what the universe is made out of. And perhaps the answer is about as satisfying as this one here. Uh, the answer, yes, is, yes, 42. And uh, likewise, cosmologists will give us answers. But there'll be answers that won't be completely satisfying. There'll be answers like these. 73.02.72, these numbers underlie the universe. They set the physical properties that, of our space that we're embedded in. And yet, um, other numbers uh, could be <laughs> in play here that we don't know about. <coughs> so anyway, that's all I've got for you now, and I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I'm happy to answer questions.